Well, it's good to be with you again. Joint Health and Lifestyle Medicine. This is the first talk I put together. It's really my, probably my area of specialty, I guess you'd say. I remember one time I was up on the wards talking with one of my physical therapists and they asked me, well, why do people get uh, arthritis? So I got out a piece of paper and I started writing out a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show you tonight. And uh, I think when uh, I was done, he was uh, a little overwhelmed maybe. <laughs> but uh, he kind of scratched his head and looked interested. And, and uh, well, your joints are very important. Uh, you know, Americans have a lot of arthritis. According to CDC, this is the leading cause of disability. This is why people have to take off work. There's about 11% of the population that knows they have arthritis, but they've never been to the doctor to get that diagnosis. There's another 20% that do have the diagnosis, so that makes about 30%. Here you can see that uh, arthritis and rheumatism makes up 17.5% of causes of disability in the United States. Back problems, that kind of goes along with it. Here's lower extremity weakness. A lot of things that contribute to disability in the United States. Now here's a map of the United States and you can see by the color how many people in that area have arthritis. Looks like we're a little better than Maine down here but there's very little difference in the percentage points even in the colors there. Arthritis increases with increasing weight of the population. Well, how can I keep my joints healthy? That's the real question, right? How do I keep them from wearing out? Well, we're going to talk about diet, we're going to talk about exercise, we're going to talk about water, and we're going to look at each of these. But first of all, a little philosophy. Disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. You mean arthritis isn't a deficiency of Moultrin? <laughs> no. Arthritis comes about when we break some of the laws of health. Well, I thought arthritis just ran in my family and, and it caught up with me. Well, families tend to live the same. You eat like your parents ate or you exercise or don't exercise like your parents did or didn't exercise. I'm going to use the knee as a model. The knee makes a good model. A lot of people have trouble with their knees. I could have just as well used the spine, the hip, the shoulder, the ankle, any part of the body. But I'm going to use the knee because it is a good example. Here's somebody's knee. Now if we took an x-ray of that knee, it would look something like this. You notice that I have an arrow there where there is a dark spot between the bones. That dark area is where the cartilage is. The cartilage holds the bones apart. And so if we were to have somebody stand up and take an x-ray, we could see how much cartilage is left in their knee. Now I'm going to superimpose the bones on top of the knee right here. And that's where they would be, kneecap right in the middle. On top is the femur, on the bottom is the tibia. And then on the end of each of the bones is the cartilage. The cartilage is kind of like, well, kind of like linoleum, a little bit soft and really smooth, and when it's wet, it's really slick. When it's dry, it's not so slick. And the cartilage has to have some water with it. In order to keep the liquid around the knee, you have a capsule, kind of like a CV joint in your car. And the capsule holds the fluid in the joint. Now, there's something interesting about cartilage, and that is it has no blood supply. I mean, it's not dead, but there are no blood vessels running through it. It depends on nutrition soaking into it. It has cells, it's alive, but it isn't going to get direct blood supply. So, where do the nutrients come from? They come from blood vessels that go nearby, like outside the joint space. Here I have a capillary. It's very enlarged. I mean, just to give you an example, one red blood cell looks like that in the capillary. So I've made them very disproportioned just for illustration. If you can keep blood flowing past the joint, then you can keep nutrition soaking into the joint. If the blood flowing to the joint gets stopped, 
then the joint starts to suffer, just like a heart attack, right? Only you get a joint attack. And so as the blood flows by, nutrition has to soak across the capillary, it has to soak across the capsule, it soaks into the cartilage, and then the reverse has to happen with waste products soaking out of the cartilage. We call it diffusion in medicine, but soaking is <laughs> easier to understand. And it soaks across the capsule, across the capillary, and into the bloodstream where the waste products are taken out by the kidney, the liver, or the lungs, or sweated out. So anything that impedes fluid flow to and from the cartilage impedes cartilage nutrition. Cartilage depends on its nutrition both for health and to repair itself. Poor nutrition and failure of repair per produce arthritis. Can everybody say arthritis? Arthritis. Okay, when we come back to this slide, I want everybody to say arthritis. Okay, so I'll say produce and you'll go? Arthritis. Good, okay, you'll be a choir. Okay, let's talk about water. I wish some of my patients had a gentleman like this walking around with his glass of water to offer it to him eight times a day. It'd be a lot more healthy. In fact, where I was uh, practicing last up in Maine, the hospital uh, wellness director decided to do something to improve the health of all the patients. And so what she did is she decided that the best thing she could do is put bottled water in all the break rooms. And so that's what they did. So they had pallets of bottled water in all the employee break rooms. This cost the hospital $25,000 a year. But at the end of the year, it reduced the amount of money being spent by insurance companies on the employees by $240,000. Three years in a row. Drinking water has a dramatic effect on people's health. How about your cartilage? Well, your cartilage is mostly water. I mean, it's supposed to be mostly water. Some people's doesn't have a lot of water because they haven't been drinking their water. Should be 65 to 80% water. Water acts like a shock absorber. It kind of lubricates the cartilage. And it's the water that carries the nutrition from the bloodstream, soaking across, down into the cartilage. And so you need your water with your cartilage. Water carries nutrition to the cartilage. It carries waste products away from the cartilage. If you don't drink enough water, your joint fluid becomes concentrated. It can permanently change. That's when arthritis sets in. Your thickened fluid actually becomes more acidic. And you know acid will eat up things like cartilage. And then the oxygen goes down in the cartilage and the cells start to die. Poor water intake starves cartilage for nutrition and saturates it in waste products. Cartilage depends on its nutrition for health and repair. Poor nutrition and failure of repair produce... Oh, that wasn't that great. Let's try again. Poor nutrition and failure of repair produce... Oh, that's better. Okay. So, what should we drink? Water. Oh, you got that right. Water. How much water should I drink? Well, it depends on how old I am, actually. As we get older, you need more water, believe it or not. You mean, you mean as I get older, I have to drink more water? Yeah, you know, you, you, you become like an old piece of leather, and so you drink more water to, to dampen it up and to... And, you know, I had one person who decided to start drinking water. Uh, she was actually drinking 12 glasses of water a day. She had a problem before she started drinking water of dry eyes. After three weeks of drinking more water, she all of a sudden noticed, hey, my eyes aren't dry anymore. She was like an old leather belt. <laughs> it took three weeks to rehydrate her. So don't just expect overnight to all of a sudden have enough water because you drank 10 glasses that day. More water as you get older. Okay, now let's talk about exercise. Moving, how important is it? Exercise is very important because cartilage has no blood supply. You have to put the heartbeat in it. 
The way you put the heartbeat in it is by walking. And as you walk, you pump your cartilage. And if you don't walk and you just stand still, you just press your cartilage down and nothing happens. So walking pumps the cartilage kind of like a heartbeat. They've done studies with radioactive tracers to see what happens. And when somebody walks, the radioactive tracers move along with the fluid. When they don't walk, nothing happens. Exercise is important. If you don't exercise, nutrition will not be pumped to and from the cartilage. Cartilage depends on its nutrition for health and repair. Poor nutrition and failure of repair produce... All right. Well, so what do we need to do? Go for a walk out in the fresh air, out in the sunshine, out where, you know, outdoor air has more oxygen in it, and that oxygen is negatively charged. It's got negative ions. It gives you a boost to your immune system. It helps your health in many ways. Yep, very important. How about obesity? Well, if you get too heavy, then you are knees begin to suffer. Overweight people carry immense loads on their cartilage. It's kind of like pressing the water out of the cartilage all the time. It squeezes the water out and they have the same problem as not drinking enough water. Metabolic acids accumulate in the knees and pretty soon, well anywhere in the body for that matter, and pretty soon you have cartilage cell death. Now here is a x-ray again of somebody's knee. Notice the dark area is where there is cartilage. This is a normal joint space. Here's somebody that's been overweight and has been walking and they've been pressing all the water out of their cartilage. You notice the joint space is getting narrower. That's not good. Now if we look over here, this person has totally worn their cartilage out and they have bone on bone arthritis. And as the bone hits bone, it's kind of like a chisel and a hammer. The hammer hits the chisel, the chisel starts to mushroom. As the chisel starts to mushroom, it gets these things off to the side. In the bone, it starts to mushroom. We call it osteophytes. And those osteophytes push on tendons and ligaments and, and nerves and blood vessels and cause pain. Okay, well, how big a problem is being overweight? The heavier a person gets, the higher their risk of arthritis. Normal weight people, only about 18% get arthritis. Very obese people, nearly half of them get arthritis. And so weight is a big cause of arthritis. Obesity impedes fluid flow to and from the cartilage, thus impeding cartilage nutrition. Cartilage depends on its nutrition for health and repair. Poor nutrition and failure of repair produce arthritis. All right. Well, what should we do? If we're overweight, we'll lose weight. Do I have to lose all my weight? Well, if you just lose 10%, it amounts to 28% improvement in knee function. So a little uh, losses in weight turn out to be big gains in function. Cartilage and diet. Well, this is a big section and we're going to go through about five different types of diet considerations. And so I want you to be aware that I'm not picking on anybody's diet. We're just talking about physiology here. When I give you the handout, you'll have all the medical references to see where we get this stuff. But your cartilage, because it has no blood supply, is very dependent on a good nutrition. First of all, let's talk about refined foods. Foods that have been processed. Foods that are high in sugar, fat, or things like that. For example, here we have some, some kind of pie or cheesecake. Refined foods. Well, why are refined foods such a problem? Well, it's because they create rouleau. Oh, what's Rouleau? Anybody hear French? Uh, rouleau means kind of like a stack or a, a chain. Um, I kind of think of it like the Michelin Man, stack of tires. Uh, what gets Rouleaued? Well, it's your cells. And here we have a normal red blood cell all by itself. 
this red blood cell is what you'd like all of them to look like. But notice these others. They're in chains. Those are Rouleau, if you will. And these Rouleau do not function well when they go down your bloodstream. I'll illustrate them up here like this. Oh, well, let's talk about your brain. Let's get away from the, the joints for a minute. You know, your brain is very dependent upon blood flow as well. So let's see what happens if we eat refined food. Time after eating a high-fat meal here on the bottom, six hours, one day, two days, three days, up this side, we have oxygen on the brain. Uh, you'd like the oxygen on your brain to be fairly high. It helps you think better, makes you do you know, better calculations when you're trying to do your taxes. Everybody get your taxes done? <laughs> and uh, so let's see what happens if we eat a high-fat meal. Oh, boy, within six hours. The oxygen on the brain fell below 70%. What's more, it did not return to normal for three whole days. That's a long time. But who stops with one high-fat meal one day? Next day, another high-fat meal. Next day, another high-fat meal. Next day, another high-fat meal. Moral of the story, some people have never had a fully functioning brain. Oh, you don't have to name anybody. All right, let's get back to the joints. Refined foods that create relo include sugar. That's right. Sugar from sodas, sugar from cakes, you name it, sugar will do it to you. How about starches? About the same, refined starches, high glycemic index foods for those of you who came here for our diabetes talk. Oil. Oil will do it as well. In fact, that's what they gave the hamster. When they gave him oil, the Rouleau effect lasted for 17 hours. 17 hours of those blood cells crawling slowly through the blood vessels. And then alcohol will do it. That's why people's brains do funny things when they get the stuff. And then cream. When they gave the hamster cream, it lasted for 21 hours. Wow, that's a long time. Rouleau impede fluid flow to and from the cartilage. This impedes cartilage nutrition. Cartilage depends on its nutrition for health and repair. Poor nutrition and failure of repair result in? All right. <laughs> You're sounding weak there. You must have been thinking about it. All right. <laughs> Okay, so what do we need? We need a diet that promotes blood flow to the cartilage. Anything that helps get blood flow. The reason we study this is a lot of people have trouble with blood flow like to their coronary arteries. So we look at things that improve blood flow for other reasons. So there's a lot of studies on this, but they found that a vegetarian diet improves blood flow. It's possibly, most probably, because of the omega-3 fatty acids. Now, people who eat a vegetarian diet get about half their oils as omega-3s. People who are on a non-vegetarian diet, they get only about 10% of their oils as omega-3s. And they're getting a lot more oil, too. And so that's a refined food causing the Rouleau. It's also more difficult to overeat on a vegetarian diet, so that helps with the weight. If you get dehydrated, it'll thicken your blood and the rouleau will be worse and you'll have more trouble with these cells sticking together. So drinking water, this is another reason to drink water for your joints. Stress will thicken your blood. Did you know when people get under stress, they're more apt to have a heart attack? This is one of the reasons. There's other reasons, but uh, stress increases the risk of rouleau. Okay, that's the refined foods. Let's talk about inflammatory foods. Is that food that makes you angry? Well, not really. It's food that increases the inflammation in your body. Why is that a problem? Well, when you get more inflammation in your body, it thickens the blood vessels. And when the blood vessel gets thickened, it's harder for nutrition to get from the blood vessel to the joint and harder for waste products to make it from the cartilage back across the thickened capillary into the bloodstream. It's kind of a barrier to your nutrition. Here's an example. This is a picture of a kidney, very highly magnified. And uh, 
here's a blood vessel wall. There's a probably a white cell sitting in the blood vessel. Notice how nice and thin the capillary wall is. Here is a kidney with inflammation. Thickened. Notice there's a rouleau right there of red blood cells. But this is a thickened capillary. See how much thicker that is? You can't get nutrition across those thickened capillaries when you have all that inflammation in your body. And so we have to do something to get rid of the inflammation. What are some examples of inflammatory foods? Well, did you know that meat was one of the most inflammatory foods? Very inflammatory. It's when you're eating something very much like you, your body doesn't know quite what to do to it, and so it often reacts to it. And one of the most inflammatory meats is actually pork. Interesting, according to the studies, pork is very inflammatory. Dairy increases inflammation. Most people have trouble with this, especially if the bacteria did a number on it for you. Highly seasoned foods tend to increase inflammation in your body. You notice that you often heat up or sweat when you eat really hot food? It's raising the, inf raising the inflammation in your body. What about foods with aflatoxins? What's aflatoxins? <laughs> aflatoxins appear in food from rotting, from the process of fermentation, aging if you will. So, for example, wine has a lot of aflatoxins. Uh, vinegar, even more. Uh, any food that was created by rotting. I had a patient come to my office one day. He was a young man who he was the track star at his high school. His mom brought him in and said, uh, you know, what can we do for him? His, his foot is hurting right underneath his toes. And uh, I looked at it and I talked to him for a little bit and and we worked out a plan for him to get better. And then his mom asked me, well, why, why would he get this inflammation? And I said, well, has he been trying different shoes? Said, no, he's had the same shoes. I said, has he been running on different surfaces? No, he's always run on the same surface. I said, well, maybe he's eating more, in, you know, something in his diet that's increasing the inflammation. And she says, well, like what? So I started going down this list and I got to vinegar and she says, vinegar? Well, she looked over at him and she says, he, eats, he drinks a half a cup of vinegar a day. I said, really? I looked over at him. I said, uh, well, do you think you could lay off the vinegar for a few weeks while we get you over this? He said, I, I think I could. I should have asked him why he did that. I <laughs> guess I didn't have enough curiosity at the time. So he stopped drinking the vinegar, went home. We had him do some things hot and cold that we're going to tell you about at the end of this lecture for sore joints. And when he came back, he was fine. He had gotten over his inflammation. Mushrooms are a source of aflatoxins. Aflatoxins are a big cause of cancer worldwide. The number one cancer worldwide is liver cancer, usually from hepatitis B. If you have hepatitis B, you have, oh, you know, somewhere around a 1% chance of getting liver cancer. If you have a bunch of aflatoxins, say mold in your basement or you're eating a bunch of aflatoxins, your risk of liver cancer goes up not just a few percent, but 200 times. As a consequence, the World Health Organization has made aflatoxins a subject of special interest worldwide. A lot of peanut butter, especially if you buy the cheap store brand peanut butter, has aflatoxins. You smell it. Smells a little different. Uh, I grew up on a farm. My grandfather often grew peanuts. If the peanuts were harvested and it remained wet outside, rainy day or something, they would start to mold and they would smell just like that cheap store-bought peanut butter. Moldy. Aflatoxins. Here's what it looks like, this mold, aspergillus mold. Anyway, you won't see it because it's very small. <laughs> Okay, inflammation impedes fluid flow to and from the cartilage, thus impeding cartilage nutrition. Cartilage depends on its nutrition for health and repair. Poor nutrition and failure of repair can result in cartilage. All right. So what do we need? We need an anti-inflammatory diet. Again, inflammation is studied because it's so important for heart disease. In fact, They've found if they check your inflammation in your body and it's high, 
it can predict the onset of a heart attack. You are at high risk of having a heart attack, a stroke, or some other major disease. And so as a result, they've studied it to see what they could do to bring the inflammation down. One of the most effective ways is to have somebody fast for a few days and then start a total vegetarian diet. Uh, it's because uh, vegetables are high in anti-inflammatory flavonoids. We call them antioxidants often. And these things bring down the inflammation in people's body. Um, remember we said that meat would raise the inflammation. So we're kind of trying to counter that. Soy products are very anti-inflammatory and have been shown to be beneficial. The omega-3 fatty acids are also anti-inflammatory. You can get them from flaxseed, olive oil has some, and like we said, the vegetarian diet in general has a lot of omega-3 in it. So there's big benefits to that. Uh, turmeric uh, seasoning is very anti-inflammatory. Okay, vasoactive foods. Who do you think is going to win here? Uh, let's see, he's getting squeezed and he's, oh, hmm. Well, and that's what happens to your blood vessels when you start eating foods that are vasoactive. The vasoactive foods cause the blood vessel to tighten down. And when it tightens down, the blood cells no longer can make it past the joint. This is happening when people are taking vasoactive foods. Well, what are some vasoactive foods? Well, coffee. It's the caffeine. What happens is the caffeine starves your arms and legs where your joints are for blood and pushes it all to your center of your body, to your brain and to your heart and to your lungs and so forth. Starves your back for blood and so your joints are not happy. While you're all happy and, oh, I feel better now, your joints are saying, I'm starving. What'd you do that to me for? <laughs> Any of these vasoactive foods, tea has caffeine, colas, same idea. Nicotine, do you think she really smokes those? Yeah. Or is she just posing? All right. Uh, there's other vasoactive foods. Cheese has tyramine, wine has tyramine, kind of like nicotine that has vasoactive properties. Vasoconstriction impedes blood flow, thus impeding fluid transfer to and from the cartilage. This impairs cartilage nutrition. Cartilage depends on its nutrition for health and repair. Poor nutrition and failure of repair produce... Okay. So what we need is the vasorelaxing diet. Vasorelaxation is the result of nerves working on the blood vessels. It's the result of nitrous oxide working on the blood vessels. If you're on a vegetarian diet, eating lots of tomatoes, getting good monounsaturated vegetable oils like olive oil, antioxidants like vitamin E, zinc or copper, those all help your blood vessels to relax. On the other hand, if you're getting a lot of cholesterol or salt, which causes hardening of the arteries, your blood vessels don't want to relax. Fat, sugar, and excess calories will all do it too. Excess calories. We're going to talk about caloric restriction a bit tomorrow when we talk about cancer. Okay, the next section is about slow transit foods. Does that mean it takes a long time for the food to get from South America up here? Well, no, not really. It means it takes a long time to get from your mouth out the other end of you. It stays in your belly a long time. There's a, a doctor that did a bunch of research on this, Dr. Burkett. He's famous for describing Burkett's lymphoma, which was named after him. In his retirement years, he decided to go around the world looking at people's Poop. Uh, everybody thought he was crazy. He went down to Africa, had his camera with him. Lo and behold, the people would poop and uh, he would land on the ground and just spread out like a cow pie. And he thought, whoa, I got out his camera. And they're all going, what's the matter with this guy? And then he, then he handed the natives a bunch of uh, corn, asked them to swallow it whole, and then come back and tell him when it came through. They came back in less than 24 hours. He said, are you sure this is the same corn? Let's try it again with some more corn. And so he gave him some more corn. Sure enough, less than 24 hours, and they were back. 
I have a friend who was a missionary over in Africa for 10 years, just came back. In the 10 years he was over there, he saw three cases of colon cancer. He's a general surgeon. Over here, his whole practice is going to be colon cancer. I've helped him on a few cases. Just lots of colon cancer over here. Why? Well, over here, he did the same experiment. Give somebody the corn, swallow it. First day, he's looking around. Where did it go? Where's that corn? No corn. Second day, where's the corn? No corn. Third day, finally, way at the end of the third day, the corn came through. 72 hours transit time. That means you have three times as much food in your belly, in your abdomen, at all times. As a consequence, there's no more pressure on your kidneys. It decreases blood flow to your kidneys. There's more pressure on the veins in the back of your abdomen. That means you have more varicose veins down your legs. There's more pressure on your esophagus. That means you have more reflux happening. It's all a problem from slow transit foods. Well, there's another problem with slow transit foods. They're high in fat and low in fiber usually. And the bacteria are having a heyday because they like that food to sit around for three days. As that food sits around for three days, they start to multiply. And as they multiply, they start putting off toxins. You ever heard of toxic shock syndrome? Well, this is kind of a subclinical toxic shock syndrome all the time as these bacteria overgrow. And they can cause troubles like Whipple's disease and Crohn's and, and ulcerative colitis. Col uh, can't even say it tonight. Colitis, they cause all kinds of problems. But the big thing for your joints is they kind of mimic all the problems we talked about before of Rouleau, where the cells are all sticking together, of vasoactive, where the blood vessels are tightening down, and inflammation, where the blood vessels are getting thicker, all because the bacteria are chewing on your food for a much longer period of time. Well, what are some slow transit foods? Well, meat is a big one. Uh, no fiber, high in fat. Fast foods, again, high in fat, low in fiber. Pastries, little or no fiber. Fried foods, lots of grease, lots of fat. High in fat, low in fiber. I'm talking about the donuts, of course. All right, greasy foods. All the different greasy foods will do it to you. Now there's another thing you have to realize, and that is if you eat late at night, then you go and lay down, your stomach wants a rest too. So if you eat and then you lay down within a few hours or a very short period after you've eaten, it takes two to three times as long for the food to digest. And so again, the bacteria overgrow and cause troubles. Slow transit foods impede fluid flow to and from the cartilage, thus impeding cartilage nutrition. Cartilage depends on its nutrition for health and repair. Poor nutrition and failure of repair cause... That's right. Okay, so we need the regular diet. Remember the old ad, smooth move X-lax? Only we want fiber to do it, not X-lax. Fiber plays a significant role. And so if you get more fiber, it helps to stabilize your stool. It helps get your waste products out of you quicker. This is one way to help your joint health. Here's the regular diet right here. Fruits and vegetables. That's right, whole grains, dried fruit, fresh vet. What's, the, what's people's favorite dried fruit for keeping regular? Prunes, yes. We're going to talk about prunes tomorrow night when we talk about cancer. They're pretty good at reducing cancer as well. Fresh vegetables, good sources of dietary fiber. Did you know if you're depressed, your colon will be depressed too? That's right. And it slows down. I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg there, but uh, they are together. All right, plaque forming foods. And here we have a plaque beginning to build right here on a blood vessel. As the plaque gets bigger, it slows the blood flow. As the plaque gets larger, it might get a clot associated with it. The clot starts to grow. Pretty soon the clot may fill the whole blood vessel. Here is a coronary, coronary angiogram. There is a plaque on either side of the blood vessel. 
Here's my plaque over here so you get an example. Here is a histological slide of a coronary artery that got a plaque here and then it got a clot and they had to take it out. So we don't want clots in our legs. We don't want clots in our blood vessels. Um, a lot of times we'll take an x-ray of a leg to look at the knee and there will be more calcium in the blood vessels than there is in the knee and that calcium is in plaque. We'll get a picture of somebody's chest and there'll be very little calcium in the backbone but there's a lot of calcium in the aorta, the blood vessel that goes down the chest and so this is a very big problem for the joints as well as the heart. That is what it's like when we eat food that causes plaque. It starts filling the arteries full of grease. I have a friend who's a plumber. He took out a piece of plumbing pipe from underneath a sink in a restaurant where they were always pouring grease down the sink and the pipe had gone from this size inside to being just this size inside because of all the grease. This happens inside your blood vessels as well. What are some examples of plaque forming foods? Well, cholesterol is high on the list. Cholesterol tends to increase that problem, especially foods like milk, eggs, cheese, especially cheese. These tend to increase the plaque. Now, not all cholesterol is the same though. Some cholesterol is worse. The worst type of cholesterol is oxidized cholesterol. What do we mean by oxidized? Well, one of the simplest ways to think of it is that oxygen comes and gets next to the cholesterol. When it gets next to the cholesterol, it oxidizes it. But then it's kind of like a game of tag where the oxygen tags the cholesterol and then the cholesterol can go and tag something else. What the cholesterol tags is usually a cell in a blood vessel in your heart or some other blood vessel in your body. When it tags a cell, the cell often dies and it becomes a nidus for a plaque. It becomes the beginning point for a plaque. <clears throat> in fact, they took a bunch of animals and they gave them some oxidized cholesterol. When they gave them the oxidized cholesterol, within 24 hours, the animals started having lesions in their blood vessels that would be the nidus for a plaque. 24 hours. And what is the most common source of oxidized cholesterol? Well, custard mixes. For example, ice cream. They take the ice cream, they mix the milk and the eggs and the cream, and then they blow it full of air, and then they freeze it suddenly. And so it has air in it, and as long as the air is there next to the cholesterol, you have oxidized cholesterol. Any prepackaged food, such as pancake mixes, where they dry the eggs, put it in there, so all you have to do is add water, those will have oxidized cholesterol. It's not just cholesterol. Any packaged food that has oil in it. Uh, there's a program uh, I uh, spent some time observing where they worked with people with coronary artery disease. When they sent people home from the program a lot healthier, they found out that people would get worse if they drank like soy milk from powdered soy milks and used packaged foods that like crackers. We have oils that are next to oxygen because the oils would become oxidized. The oxidized oils would then bother the blood vessels and cause the same problem. Oxidized cholesterol. Any food high in fat, just like this gentleman, what was he eating? Cheeseburger and milkshake. Yeah. Oh, reminds me when I was in residency, first year we had to do general surgery. They had a gentleman who had just been down to McDonald's and went around the corner and he ran into somebody with his pickup truck or somebody ran into him. Came in in the ambulance, they had to take him to surgery, opened him up and here he'd been eating all this fat and usually you look in at the intestines and you can't see anything but just the intestine. But there are actually lymphatics all over the intestines and this gen gentleman's lymphatics were all full of fat little shiny blobs of fat so you could see every lymphatic on the intestines because that's where the oil comes out of the food is at the intestines. Very interesting 
lesson in anatomy, but very interesting lesson in nutrition as well. Foods that are high in saturated fat, both from animal sources and from chemical sources such as trans fat, hydrogenated you know, oils like margarine, these increase the risk of plaque in your blood vessels. Now, trans fat can come from different sources. It can come from hydrogenation, but it can also come from frying foods. Did you know that oil isn't a very good thing to cook things in? It tends to deteriorate. There was one group that decided to study and figure out what's the best oil we can use to fry things in. So they took two vats, you know, like they fry um, french fries in it at the fast food places. One vat they filled with the best cold pressed, cold processed, extra virgin olive oil. The other vat got the usual run of the mill oil. They fried two fryings and then they checked the oil. The olive oil had lost all its good phytochemicals, all of its good antioxidants. It now had all kinds of products of combustion running around in it, and it had some trans fat. Oils don't stand heat very well. It's better if you want the oil flavor to cook your food some other way, such as, you know, use a wok and, and uh, saute in water or something, and then add oil later for flavoring, if you must have the oil. Plaque impede blood flow. This impedes cartilage nutrition. Cartilage depends on its nutrition for health and repair. Poor nutrition and failure of repair result in cartilage. All right, so what do we need to take care of this problem? Plaque. We got rid of inflammation with an anti-inflammatory diet. We got rid of Rouleau with a blood flow diet. What are we going to do for plaque? Do we need an angioplasty? or maybe a stent? Well, Coldwell Estelstein of the Cleveland Clinic has shown on angiography that you can open blood vessels up on lifestyle changes alone. Notice here this blood vessel is nearly completely blocked. 32 months later on his special program and it's wide open. No angioplasty, no stents, just lifestyle changes. You can open those blood vessels back up again. Well, what's his lifestyle changes? What's his diet? The optimal diet consists of grains, legumes, vegetables, and fruit with less than 10 to 15 percent of the calories coming from fat. Low-fat diet. He goes on to say that this diet minimizes the likelihood of stroke, obesity, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and cancers of the breast, prostate, colon, rectum, and ovary. Boy, that sounds like a good insurance program. Did Medicare ever promise that? How about Blue Cross? No, we have to take care of ourselves, don't we? This gentleman's been at the forefront of science showing that a good lifestyle can clean out the blood vessels. All right, so what should I eat? How about an unrefined plant-based diet? That's right, that will clean out those blood vessels. Well, that's the original diet, isn't it? The Bible diet. You look at Genesis, then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food and you will eat the plants of the field. That's a good program, isn't it? Just think, if everybody's stuck with that, we might not have much arthritis. Well, in summary, anything that impedes fluid flow to and from the cartilage impedes cartilage nutrition. <coughs> cartilage depends on its nutrition for health and repair. Poor nutrition and failure of repair produce arthritis. arthritis. But I've already got arthritis. What do I do now? Or am I stuck? Well, you know, there's things you can do to make sure that you do better as you get older. One of those is make sure you're strong. In a study of people who had stronger grip strength, which is a good measure of strength for your whole body, they found that 25 years later, those people had less limitations with walking. They did better at doing housework. They could walk farther. They could walk up steps faster. They could lift more weight. People who stay strong have less disability. Another study, they looked at people who had knee pain and were overweight. We'll talk about this on Saturday night. But 
These people were saying, I can't exercise, I've got knee pain. Well, they took a whole bunch of them and put them on a six-month program. They started them exercise. They started them moving. And as they started moving, they discovered they got better. Their knee pain got less. They were able to walk faster. They limped less. They could walk up and down stairs faster. They improved. You see, we rust out before we wear out. So to remain independent, it's good to stay strong, to keep exercising, do a little weightlifting as well, and keep those joints moving. Flexibility is important to keep you from straining joints. It helps protect against back pain. It helps keep your bones from losing their minerals, like as in osteoporosis. It prevents the loss of muscle mass. It improves your figure, and it decreases disability in old age. Yeah, but my joint really hurts. What am I going to do about my joint? If I keep on the way I'm going, I'm going to just die. Well, <laughs> I, uh, I was moving a bunch of furniture and for some reason I stepped on something and I twisted my ankle really bad. I mean, I couldn't walk on my foot. I thought I'd broken something. I'm thinking, oh no, I'm the doctor and I broke it. <laughs> I'll be in the I'll be in the office walking around with a cast and everybody will come in laughing, Doctor, heal yourself. <laughs> you never do that to your doctors, do you? <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> well, so uh, I thought, oh, this isn't good. I was crawling around the house. I was thinking I'm going to have to put on my own cast because I'm going to be embarrassed to have my colleague do it. <laughs> so I started doing what I'm going to tell you to do here. I started doing hot and cold on my ankle. First I put my ankle in a bucket of hot water, as hot as I could stand, for three minutes. First I'll tell you what I did and then I'll tell you why I did it. Three minutes in hot water. Then I switched over to ice cold water for one minute. And when you do that you want a few ice cubes floating around in that water too. And so then I switched back to three minutes of hot and then back to one minute of cold. I alternated three times, back and forth, back and forth, and then I ended with cold. And after I ended with cold, then I put on a nice sock and I went and rested for about a half hour. After I did this for a couple days, my ankle was feeling so good, I almost forgot I had injured it. And then I twisted it again. <laughs> so I went back and did my hot and cold and it was good again. Luckily I didn't break it, but boy. <laughs> Hot and cold makes a big difference. Well, is this hocus pocus? Does this really work? Sure does. When you put it in the hot water, it increases the blood flow. All the blood vessels start to expand. They get larger. You know how when you're warm, your blood vessels on your hands expand? This is going on in any area that you heat up. And so the blood starts flowing there more. It brings more healing factors in, brings more white cells. It washes out inflammation. Then, when you switch over to cold for a lesser amount of time, the surface vessels constrict, but the deep ones stay open. So it forces the blood down where the injury is, down where the tendons are, the ligaments, the cartilage, every part of your joint, and it helps get the blood flowing there. When you go back and forth, open, closed, open, closed, dilate, contract, dilate, it tends to pump the tissue and that extra swelling, that extra fluid in the area starts getting pumped out and it reduces swelling. What's more, it wakes up the white blood cells. In fact, Mayo Clinic showed if you did this to your whole body, you could raise your white count four times normal. Now when we talk about bird flu, we're going to talk about that, but uh, four times normal. Those white cells are responsible for organizing the healing process. And so that's very helpful. And then when you end in cold, your body goes, oh, it's cold down here, and it goes and warms it up. And that helps with the healing as well. Very helpful. So what kind of injuries can I use this on? Can I use it on any joint? Yeah, you can use it on your back, you can use it on your elbows, on your shoulders, on your wrists, on your knees, on your ankles. Anywhere you can apply the heat, it works. Well, how about fresh injuries? Well, like my ankle. Now, if my ankle had been swollen three times normal, 
or if my ankle had been really purple, like it had bled in there, then I probably wouldn't use hot. What would I use instead? Well, I would use an ice cube, an ice block, and start massaging the area. This works very effectively. What you do is you take a block of ice, put something around it so you're insulated from it, and start to rub the area. For the first minute, it burns. It's really cold. You can put the ice right on the skin. For the next minute, it aches really deep, really deep. And then over the next three minutes, it starts to get less achy and tingly. And then after about seven, eight minutes, it goes numb. The pain goes completely away. I keep doing it for maybe 12, 13, 14, 15 minutes and then stop. Very helpful, takes away the pain and it also has a rebound effect to increase healing in a hurry. Use it on injured bones, broken bones, joints, ligaments, tendons, muscles, whatever it is that you need to use it on and it increases healing. Okay, why should we suffer arthritis? Can't do what you always wanted to do. Pain, swelling, deformity, burden to others, disability, inactivity, isolation, early death. Early death? Really? You know, if a lady has arthritis of the knees, real bad, at age 67, 68, 69, and they replace the knees, she'll live seven years longer than if they don't replace the knees because she's taking less poisonous pills and getting more exercise. <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, we want to drink adequate water. Exercise daily and choose a wholesome diet. How many want to do that and avoid, avoid arthritis? Yes. Very good.